In this episode from Chapter 2A, we're going to cover what is a compound, and then we're also going to go over the types of chemical bonds that can make a compound. And these would be a covalent bond, an ionic bond. But first off, what is a compound? Well, a compound is the chemical combination of two or more elements in a fixed ratio. So when you see the word chemical combination, you always want to think of a chemical bond, you know, either the ionic or the, the covalent kind. And in a fixed ratio, that means you're, only go, or you're always going to have this number of one element and this number of the other element. So for example, we're all familiar with water. Okay, and water has two hydrogens for every one oxygen, always, a two to one ratio. And in fact, as you can see right here, you see how there's no number right there? There actually is a one. We just never write it, all right? So whenever you see a chemical symbol with no number next to it, just assume that there's a one, all right? Now, one of the other things that's also really neat about compounds is that the properties of the compound are totally different than what it's made from, all right? So you have water, which is made out of hydrogen, just typically a gas, um, pretty flammable, especially in the presence or presence of oxygen, which is also a gas. So if you ever came across in your history classes uh, the Hindenburg tragedy back in the 20s, um, that blimp um, basically burned and a number of people died because it was filled with hydrogen. Well, the hydrogen was sparked and then it quickly combined with the oxygen that's in the air and it, and it just made this big giant flame ball that just devoured that that blimp um, very very quickly uh, you can find it on YouTube you can catch a, a video there's a famous line from the the news person who was filming it where he goes oh the humanity yeah. okay now over here water doesn't even burn in fact we use water to put out fires all right so when you combine these hydrogens and these oxygens together, you create a compound that has totally different properties than the hydrogen and the oxygen gas if those elements were by themselves. Okay? All right, let's brush that away and move on. All right, so what are valence electrons? These are electrons that are found in the outer energy level. And these guys are really, really important because what they do is they are used to form the chemical bonds. So if you look down here in all these pictures, and we'll just focus on boron over here, all right? Boron has one, two, three, four, five electrons. But we only care about the valence electrons, which are the outer level. It's going to be these electrons that are used in the chemical bonds, okay? Over here, silicon, it's got 14 electrons, but we only care about these one, two, three, four. And then over here with antimony, 51. Of course, these five only matter. Okay, now let's look at silicon because it's very similar to carbon. All right, one of the things that uh, an atom wants is it wants a full outer shell. So, whoops, let's try that again. Okay, it wants a full outer shell. And typically, that means it wants eight electrons. Now there's a few exceptions to that rule, but they're really pretty rare. Okay, so we call this the octet rule. Okay, an atom is only happy when its outer shell is full, and typically that means it wants to have eight electrons. All right, so let's go back here to silicon. One, two, three, four. It can bond with four different atoms with the, the goal of reaching eight, okay? So if it bonded with an atom and it gained one here, gained one there, gained one here, and gained one there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that atom would be happy because it satisfied the octet rule. All right, so let's see the octet rule in action. Let's brush that away. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so. Ionic bonds. An ionic bond occurs when electrons are transferred from one atom to another. 
<clears throat> now what this will do is I'm going to change my color over here. All right. When you transfer an electron, in other words, one atom has given its electron to another. All right, so one gave and one received. Okay, the one that lost the atom, that one will become positive. Did I say lost an atom? One that lost an electron. Let's try that again. Okay, the one that gained an electron will become negative. Okay. Uh, you become positive because now typically an atom is neutral. So in carbon's case, six electrons and six protons. That's a neutral carbon atom. But if it lost one electron, now it would have five negatives, six positives, and that would make it one positive. Right. Simple math, just like what you have in your math class. All right. Now, Atoms that have gained or lost an electron are called an ion, okay? So ions are a charged particle. In other words, they have an electric charge. So think of an atom with an electric charge, even a, either, or either a positive charge or a negative charge. So you'd have a positive ion and you would have a negative ion. All right, over here is the classic example of salt, sodium chloride, all right? NaCl. This would be the table salt. Put on your French fries, on tater chips, all that kind of good stuff. All right. As you can see here, this is sodium. Uh, the Na comes from the Latin word for sodium, which I do not remember off the top of my head. Okay. See this valence electron right there? It's only got one. What would it like to have? Eight. The octet rule. Okay. Now, sodium's got some choices. It can either gain seven or if it lost one, now its outer shell, which would be the one underneath it, would have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So which one do you think is the easiest? To gain seven or to lose one? Obviously, get rid of that one is the easiest. So what happens is that valence electron will pop off and that will make sodium positive. Now, chlorine is kind of the opposite. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in its outer shell. What would it like to have? Eight, do the octet rule. So it's got two choices. It can lose seven or it can gain one, and obviously gain in one, all right? So what happens here is sodium will donate its electron to chlorine. That will make sodium plus one. Chlorine will be negative one. And then they will bond together because a positive and a negative will attract. And they'll kind of just stick together like a magnet. Now, as we saw back another slide or two, a compound is very different than the two elements that are used to make it up. Sodium is actually a metal. And it's highly reactive. In fact, if you put sodium in water, it's going to explode. You, you can't find sodium in nature. It's always combined with something. It's incredibly reactive. All right, chlorine is actually a gas, and it's incredibly poisonous. In, in fact, in World War I, in the trench warfare, uh, chlorine gas was used as a poison as part of the chemical warfare, the beginning of the chemical warfare. All right, so as you can see here, we have a ex very explosive, highly reactive metal that's going to combine with a uh, poisonous gas. You put those two together and you have table salt, something that we have to have to survive. And All right, so what's a covalent bond? Well, if you look at the word itself, okay, you have co and you have valent. All right, so co simply means to share. Well, what are you sharing? Valence electrons. Yeah, I guess I didn't need to write that because right here, electrons are shared between atoms. Now, the one thing you want to remember is that electrons are shared in a pair. So, if you have one pair of electrons being shared, that's a single bond. If you have two pairs of electrons, those are double bonds. And then obviously three pair, that would be a triple bond. All right, so like hydrogen, 
they would have a single bond. So as you can see right there, that line is a single covalent bond. Okay, uh, a double bond uh, that would be oxygen. The oxygen that you breathe in is di a double bond. And yeah, I don't remember any triple bonds off the top of my head. Uh, they're not as common as these two, so I kind of always just gloss over those. Okay, any compound that is held together by a covalent bond is called a molecule. And the great way to remember this one is, is that you want to share your electrons with that pretty girl in your chemistry class, let me get caught up here, named Molly Kuehl. Get it? Molly Kuehl. Share your electrons with that pretty girl in your chemistry class named Molly Kuehl. Simple way to remember it. Kind of goofy, but that just works for me. Okay, now one thing you will want to know about covalent bonds is A, they're very common in living things. Most of the bonds in your body are um, covalent bonds and they're actually very, very stable. All right, so over here in this graphic down here in the lower right, yeah, let's pick a different color. There we go, let's try this one. Okay, there's two different ways you can, you can draw it. All right, here we have a, a Bohr's model again. And as you can see, these electrons right here are being shared. Okay, And this is actually a molecule of methane, which is natural gas. Okay, We can also draw the shared electrons this way, where that line equals one pair of electrons, just like was drawn up in here. Okay, And this here also, as you can see, CH4. This one's also methane or natural gas. All right, let's brush those away. All right, and this is our final slide from this uh, podcast. And this one's going to talk about something extremely strange and kind of weird, but it's also it's it's there in nature. And these are called van der Waals forces, and obviously they're named after a Dutch scientist who uh, discovered them. And these are a weak attraction. A different color in here. This is a weak attraction between molecules when they are very very close together. And what happens in these guys is if you notice in a molecule you got a positive nucleus and you've got a negative electron cloud. All right. Well what happens is this cloud it's never evenly spaced. Okay. Sometimes all the electrons move over here. Next, next second they might be over here. It just kind of moves around. So Van der Waals forces are, are kind of temporary. They're not always there, but there's enough of these atoms doing these things that you can kind of always find them. All right, so as you can see here, all the electrons in the cloud are on one side. And the same thing's happening over in this atom. So what's happening is this negative is being attracted to that positive, and that's a van der Waals force. Now, as you can see here, the gecko, it has a bunch of these atoms who are doing this van der Waals forces, and we have some atoms on this mirror that's doing the same thing, and that's how these guys can cling to whatever's going on, all right? So just remember, very quick interaction between a negative side of, a, of an atom with a positive side in an atom. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. So until next time, we'll catch you later.